The artists James McElhenney and Frank Heider first became friends in 1973 when they were accepted into the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, a prestigious program for emerging artists which numbers Alex Katz, Ellsworth Kelly, Nancy Graves, and Janet Fish as alumni. I recently filmed a conversation between these two now mature artists as they reminisced and discussed how their artistic lives have evolved since that seminal experience in Maine. Well, Frank and I first met in 1973. We were both going to Skowhegan and we both lived close to Philadelphia. I didn't have a car. He was very interested in having help with gas and companionship on the long drive to Maine. And we were there for 10 weeks. Uh, we both began to concentrate on landscape. From the very beginning, there was a sense of curiosity about the other person. We were really in totally different traditions. Uh, at the time, he was at the Tyler School. And I had graduated from Maryland and was a first semester graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. I was painting pretty much exclusively figures. Jim was painting still lifes and buildings. The journey to Skowhegan set the stage for what took place there. We sort of got along well enough in the car that when we got there, we aligned ourselves in comparison to all the other people that were there. The immense range of talent, energy, and completely different points of view pushed us together and we decided to come up with our idea versus all the other ideas. There were five people at Skowhegan from Tyler. In spite of that, Frank and I became companions in expeditions to explore the landscape as a subject. But up to that point, neither one of us was really committed to making landscapes. The force of the landscape in Maine was so intense, it seemed like the only thing you could do was pay attention to the landscape in some way or another. We all had cubicles where we could organize little mini studios. The idea of staying indoors and painting either ideas out of our head or still life setups seemed absurd when we had this great resource all around us. Jim and I painted together, but he determined to meet everybody in, in the camp and do an investigation with them. And then we would sit and discuss the different people and points of view. We sort of became associated by absolutely everybody in camp as like a team. There was a lot of rancor about issues of style, abstraction versus representation people who painted the figure, people who painted landscape, people who painted with tape, hard edge, minimalist abstraction versus people who were using more of an abstract expressionist approach. To this day, 30, 40 years later practically, the landscape is a central issue in both of our work, but we're in completely different worlds, how we approach it. But there's still this idea that you go into the landscape. Well, there was a lot of resistance to that from our critics at Skowhegan. Frank, in a waggish moment, decided to announce to everybody that we were going to form Sunsets Incorporated and we were going to take our show on the road into mosquito-infested woods, and we did almost every day. There was this funny moment where we both determined to do monumental work. So I, I had a six-foot square piece, and he had set up an even larger, more horizontal formatted canvas. There was a fence between us, a picket fence, and he's on one side, I'm on the other. We would start in the morning, work till lunch, walk about three-quarters of a mile to lunchroom, have come back. And every day we would come back, there would be a paint tube missing or a brush missing from his palette. And my palette was never being touched. Every day something else would happen. He's convinced that somebody in the camp who had been reacting to our team-like character had it in for him. So he's going around confronting various individuals that he suspected. Finally, one day we came back and his palette was knocked over and he had this big piece of glass which he really felt fond of and it was broken. 
and he was beside himself with anger. And I saw him pushing people against the wall and accusing people. And everybody was a buzz about this event. We came back from lunch the very next day, a little early, and we discovered what was the problem. The sheep had been coming in from the pasture when we would leave, and they were eating his paint. So there were all these sheep with yellow and orange and red faces clustered around his palate, and, uh, That's true. and they couldn't get to my paintings because of the fence. He did have uh, a tendency to exercise a certain degree of savage wit. Uh, at the expense of our fellow artists there, and not all of them were happy about that, and so it was reasonable to assume that a few of them might have been seeking revenge for some offense or slight that, that either of us had inflicted upon them in a critique or, or at the lunch table or something. We interacted intensely with the critics. We argued with Mel Bachner, with Klaus Holdenberg. We went a mano a mano with everybody in camp about ideas. It was a very macho environment. The way a critique was held was often very rancorous and abusive and profane at times and impassioned. I remember at one point there was a critique where Bill Williams posed the question of how one could paint representationally when men were playing golf on the moon. It was a very competitive environment, verbal environment. Of that we made the most. When Mel Bachner came, it was a very hip artist who had just had a show at the Whitney of extremely esoteric pieces. He refused to show images of his work because he said, if you really were a serious artist, you should know everything about him before he <laughs> arrived. And when 150 people who had come for this talk tried to press him on the issue, he would not give in. And at some point I asked him a question and he accused me of being a romantic. I said, well, what's wrong with that? And with that he made another negative comment. And Janet Fish hollered out, I've had enough of this. And with that, a true fight broke out. People were throwing and pushing and rolling out of this barn into the dark of night. Now, when I go and I see art fairs, there's Mel Bachner making paintings. Now, he's using words, but they're painted with the same sensibility that artists who make paintings like I was making at that time think about paint and edges and light. Everybody develops. Everybody evolves. Mel Bachner's work has evolved. He's got a show up now at the Jewish Museum. I think the purpose for our conversation is to sort of compare and to contrast our evolution from that spark of inspiration we got from the landscape in Maine back in 73. The message I got from that experience that started at Skowhegan and continued afterwards was you literally had to step into the landscape and you had to find your painting in that space. There was something vital about stepping into that space and reacting to it. I am far less of an observational and realist painter today, but very much more interested in the emotional reality of the landscape and what it means to me and to human beings as a species. And uh, Jim is in the tradition of those early moments of where we were traveling and looking and working has gone all over the globe and has done these documentary drawings and journal-like paintings of these very particular spaces in a very particular way. It's as if the same seed grew two distinctly different trees. I didn't actually do it entirely by choice. It was because almost 10 years ago I had a serious illness, a pulmonary infection, after which I was unable to abide the company of oil paint. So I had to teach myself how to paint acrylic, watercolor. I found out that I didn't really like painting in acrylic. It was too mechanical, especially if you're trying to paint imagery because of how the colors change when they dry and how you, you have to sort of warehouse every color you mix, you know, in order to be able to continue from one day to the next. My own work has become more about the activity, less about the painting. Frank's work, he's been much more interested in creating environments. The lesson that you got out of the landscape, we see here in this room this immense painting. When we were students at Skowhegan, he used to have this habit of interviewing everybody, and he still does that for the Smithsonian now. And if you want to understand the man, you look at the boy. Frank is more of an object maker. He's a maker of things. The Vulcan of art pounding out this immense output of sculptures and paintings and prints and images. I'm not that way. I'm actually more of a conceptual artist. I'm much more of a process 
based artist. I'm an empiricist in the sort of Humboldtian sense of looking for the artistic moment in the physical world through exploring it. When I was working uh, on a body of paintings extracted from the travels to battlefields of the South, at the time I still wanted to believe it was about painting, but now I understand it was not really about painting at all. Painting was an activity I used to do something else, which was to explore. Finally, I just ended up working in watercolor. And all this time, I'm continuing to draw in books. I'm keeping sketchbooks, journals. And I think it was on a couple of these trips with my wife, the art historian Kathy Manthorne, who travels a lot as in demand. I began working mostly in journals, elaborating ideas beyond the point where in years past I would just simply approach a drawing in a book as a study or a sketch. I would actually start the paintings on site, push them, return to the hotel, you know, have a drink, keep working on these two pages until it was a painting. And then it occurred to me that this might be a good idea because I could lay the book on a scanner, I could immediately have a tiff, I could have it on the internet in about a minute. And so it was a way to get my paintings out there quickly and the way to start a dialogue about them with, with other artists. This is my studio. This is my studio. I've got one of these. I've got brushes. I've got mark making tools. I've got a book. Watch. Done. That means I'm mobile. That means I can go anywhere. That means wherever I go, whatever I want to look at, there's nothing keeping me from turning it into something through the process of painting, through the process of drawing. Ultimately, I'm not interested in describing the place. I'm interested in finding something that no one else could see in that place. I want to find my landscape. I want to devour that landscape visually and I want to rediscover it in other ways. That's really the function of those drawings. We heard about this guy, Frank Heider. What does he do? Is he a painter? I'd have to pause and I might say, well, painting was his starting point, but he does a lot of other things too. My earliest true art making experience was by accident, I discovered a guy who taught me how to make woodcuts. And it became a kind of foundation in my history. After that, I learned from a portrait artist how to draw heads and faces, and that became a fascination. So after I went to art school, I learned all sorts of things about figure painting, about space painting. And when I got out of art school, I began to experiment with making drawings and paintings together. I would make a painting, then make a woodcut from the painting, and then one day somebody said to me, why don't you just combine the two things? I took that as not a bad idea. I was never interested in making prints. I was only interested in carving into the block. I began to make ceramic pieces, and I began to discover that you could carve it and do things to it just like I could the wood. You could paint on it with the glazes. I started painting on wood using all acrylic paint as if it was watercolor and then carving into it and then drawing on top of it with oil sticks and crepe paws. I started putting oil paint on top of that. Sometimes I didn't like the way things were going so I would pick up the wood chips off the floor and nail them back onto the surface and I began to create another kind of art making language. That evolved into enormous panels like these here in the room which you could manipulate on the hinges. I was discovering that I was a sculptor interested in installation as much as I was a painter. I gravitate towards art that uses line more than tone. And the lines led me to begin to make sculptures using bamboo when I was in the forest. That led me to sticks, creating forms that I could build out of tubing and then cover with paper and paint or print onto. Some of those you could step inside of, some you could walk on, some you could handle. When I was in the forest, I became so interested in how light went through things that I became interested in making 
images <coughs> on translucent paper with color and putting light behind it which if I had done that in art school, they would have pushed me out the front door. But uh, uh, when I was doing it in my studio, it made a lot of sense. I met this Cuban artist in Miami. Would I like to make a monumental balloon? And I began making inflatables. I loved the idea that I could make inflatables that I could paint, that I could put into a suitcase and travel and fly from city to city and open and it became 30 feet tall. And so for me, it's just been one thing that's kind of led me to the other. And in the end, I'm looking for some essential thing that doesn't exist in nature, but is the result of nature. It's been 41 years since Frank Heider and James McElhenney spent the summer together in Skowhegan. I will end this film by letting each of them share a bit of insight into the creative life. To really have courage as an artist, you have to do it with or without the encouragement of the marketplace and, and hope that the, the marketplace will find you. Sidney Felsen, I interviewed for the Rauschenberg Foundation, said Bob Rauschenberg never did anything for money. He figured he got paid because he got it right. All they were trying to do is get it right. Now people are trying to do it for the reward and they're not getting it right. has to be working. You don't rest. As you know, the British say, a change is as good as a rest, so you just simply work in a different mode. My first real great art teacher taught me something. That art had to be connected to everything in life and could come from anything in life.